All right, welcome to uh, the second video of the series. Uh, this is photogrammetry, uh, the second video. And in this, you're starting to see uh, what is required to, you know, take the pictures of a model and then bring them into a software and then clean them up and then run them inside the software. This is not covering the cleanup of the model. Um, I think that would be the third part of the series. But the end goal of the entire series, just to kind of like get you motivated to watch this series, is to have something where you capture, you know, like let's say you pick a flower out of your garden, um, then you can scan it, okay? And then 3D print it out. Uh, you get a skull, you know, you get, there's a real life skull, okay? You scan it and you print it out. Easy as that, right? No more buying little furry creatures online or no more, you know, uh, destroying every flower in your garden. <laughs> so, carnations, roses, wherever you want. Sweet. So that's the idea of the series, and welcome to the second part of the video, or the second video, and enjoy. Alright, so I wanted to kind of go over what I do at home. Uh, that would be the second version of what equipment and um, methods do I use outside of a studio. Because that's where you're probably going to be anyway, right? So there's a 10 inch circle. It's made out of pink foam. Okay, quarter inch pink foam. That's the insulation you get at most hardware stores when you go to line a house on the outside of your house. You got, uh, before you put down your vinyl siding, you got this pink foam that you put down, that's the same pink foam. You get a special spray paint that you can spray foam with, you can buy it at any hardware store, it's called foam paint, uh, it's, it's a thing really, and it's pretty common to buy. Uh, you spray that down and then you can spray different colors on it. The reason I'm using pink foam, it's light, okay, it's very lightweight. That's on a stepper motor, this setup rotates itself. Um, I'm not ready to release uh, the schematics or any of that stuff just yet. I've, I've been learning too as far as like um, the best kind of combination of stepper motor and stepper motor driver. So I've been trying to look for stuff that's uh, readily available and inexpensive to build rather than scarce which is right now everything's scarce um, so stepper motor drivers are pretty rare when it comes down to the good ones uh, so I've been trying to use 3d printer stepper motor drivers which are a dime a dozen on Amazon getting there anyway you don't need that okay you don't need to rotate it automatically but that's the reason why pink foam it's lightweight so the stepper motor can handle it uh, the background is a little different because I'm running a skull today this little tiny mink skull you notice the skull is colored it has been dipped in walnut stain and that is so it can like get all the cracks and crevices and have some unique landmarks on it older skulls work a little bit better for this I've noticed the newer ones you buy on like eBay uh, they they have like a fatty deposit in them, so it doesn't accept the stain very well. All right, so what you do is because it's pink foam, you can put pins in it. So I'll put the model down, and I'll put some of these steel pins in it. And then just kind of rotate it around and kind of get an idea of, hey, is that centered? And that's really not, so I should have looked at that better. The reason you want to pin this down is because it cannot rotate or move after the fact. It has to stay in that one position until you get all the shots. That feels a little bit better. 
All right, so down here below, I have my cell phone. It is on uh, one tripod with a cell phone holder. Okay, doesn't matter the tripod so much, just as long as you can attach it to the cell phone holder, that's all you really need. And what's nice about the cell phone is you can get two or three angles, and it's very wide angle. So, in other words, if you get a tripod that can raise up like this without raising the legs and then rotate down boom now I have every angle I need I got I can go here I can go here and I can go here and about three angles is all what you really need kind of seeing that shot How, okay, so you don't want to do this, okay? You don't want to zoom, <laughs> no zoom. It's, be, it's best to have like a very high megapixel shot with no zoom. It'll find it in there, it'll find it. Okay, so fight the zooming. But what you do want to do is make sure that you have, you know, your autofocus. I'm using a program right now uh, at home called Open Camera. Uh, the only thing I don't like about Open Camera is when you go into manual focus mode, you can't see the green lines like I explained in the last one. But what's nice about Open Camera is there's an opportunity to program it. Uh, so I can use an external shutter uh, to press the button, okay? So in order to uh, get this, I do zoom just for a sec. And I just zoom long enough to do this. Boom, that's in focus. Then I zoom back out, boom. And I'll just take a shot. Cool. Nice. All right, so I'll take you off camera for a sec, or off tripod, and I'll show you around, <laughs> just to give you an idea of what everything kind of looks like. So this is my trigger mechanism. Uh, it is non-Bluetooth though, however, so it's based upon the Arduino um, and a stepper motor driver, and it's really nice because there's just a stop and go, okay? This works really good for the Nikon camera. It does not work for my cell phone. So what I've been doing is uh, reverse, or making this box uh, into a Bluetooth. So this is my <laughs> hot ass, hot, uh, wiring diagram here and yeah so far I'm using the uh, ESP32 this is the one thing I want to eliminate I want to get to polo drivers um, and I'm just using a beta uh, little button system right now so that's what it kind of looks like when you when you beta test it's like you got this uh, <laughs> really big power spot you got my power supply tackle box I call it um, I use this a lot when I go to uh, beta test circuits. So it's got the power unit inside, it's got the regulator, um, it's got a way of voltage out uh, via plugs because I hate banana plugs and I can just plug those into the circuit board and away I go to find out what power supply I need for this. Cool, long story short, when I press this button, um, as long as my camera or cell phone is in Bluetooth mode. You can see there's 3D scanner, it's connected. And press the button. Away it goes. Boom. Rotates. Shot. Rotate. Now I can go, I don't know, do anything I want while it does its little thing. So 
So once I get everything down to a circuit that makes sense, then I'll I'll provide schematics and uh, what you would need to build that circuit. Maybe even a little video on how to build the circuit. It's not too complex, but it is. My first rendition looks like this. Ooh. That's where the polo driver goes. That's on shipment from Amazon. Yay. And this setup handles the Nikon camera too. So it handles Nikon cameras and it handles uh, cell phone at once. All right, so this first run I do is I'm just kind of like looking for things that are going just a little bit wrong. Um, I can easily delete out the photos off my camera if I need to. But what I'm looking for is uh, what's happening is this shadow. You can see there's a shadow right about there in the background and it's rotating along with the model. Okay, so those, that, that rotating vector point is not going to work. Um, so I'm going to have to come up with, uh, you know, like a floodlight or something like that. I use this light to kill shadows. But now you see that it got too bright. Okay, so that's a great way to do it. But now I got the rotating shadow on the floor of the model instead of now in the background. So that's what you have to deal with as far as like the lighting is concerned if you're using a situation like this is you got to try to figure out a way to eliminate the shadows in the background and eliminate the shadows uh, on the, the bottom part of it at the same time. It's a, tr it's a little bit of a trick, there's no doubt about it. Um, so I'm going to uh, set up another little fluorescent here, bulb to kill the shadows. So this is Betsy, I call her. I, can't, I think you can still buy these. These are amazing. Uh, big fluorescent bulb. What you saw was shadows earlier. It was happening on this bulb. That's an LED. Now I'm just kind of moving that light to see what angle I need to put it at in order to get rid of the shadows. You can see the shadows move. Okay. So I need to put it right there to get no shadows. Um, so either I hire my kid to hold it there or find some kind of stand. So it's a good idea to keep all this on an SD card and use a thing called File Manager. Uh, and make sure in open camera that it's saving to a different location on your camera. So I have, for example, open camera folder. And I want to wipe out all this stuff. So I just highlight the, oops, highlight the top one, highlight the bottom one and then hit this little button in the corner and delete. Boom, empty. So, then I can switch right back to open camera. All right, so I got better lighting. It's in the corner now. It's not interfacing with the model. I'm just gonna hit that button again and let it go. Again, I'm kind of looking at the shadows. So there's one on the ground, but it's nearly not as bad as the one in the background was. You can see it on the right hand side, just a little bit of the model right there. 
you also see that it's not as rotating and it's not interfacing, so it's it's good. Should be. So there's no real limit to the amount of pictures that you can put in MetaShape, um, which is nice. So when it gets done with its first session, when it gets all the way, its first 50 shots all rotated, what I'll do then is I'll just manually rotate it a little bit and then hit the button again, and then it will take 50 more shots and offset it. Now, why not just 100? Um, or why not just program an offset in there, right? Yeah, that's where I'm, that's where the fun is. So, so it needs an interface that you can like maybe do that, or not. Maybe just keep it simple. But for right now, I'm just manually rotating it randomly, and then boom, hit the button, and it'll take 50 more shots in that one angle. All right, lower the angle, hitting it. Uh, one thing you should know is like if your camera times out with open camera uh, It's nice because when you launch open camera, it's in the same settings and everything that it was before so you don't have to oh, Go and try to figure out what ISO you were or what shutter speed you had or anything like that So that's a another really big advantage with the open camera software the only thing I don't like is the fact that I can't figure out how to change the white balance. So I have to change the white balance in uh, Lightroom instead. Alright, as I move through the angles and think about things that should be uh, talked about, uh, one thing I would not do is move your lights. Okay, so you might be tempted if you were taking the pictures of the underside of a model, right, to move your lights so that it goes up. And you don't want to do that because then it moves shadows too, and the shadows would constitute a vector point. So this really is representative outside. If you go to do photogrammetry outside, uh, people always talk about racing the sun when they're doing this. And it makes sense because if, you know, like the sun goes across, the angles of the shadows definitely change too. So you don't want to move your shadows. I didn't talk about the angle of the skull either, so when you do a skull, you want to do it so, or any kind of thing, you want to do it so that the details on the bottom and top are at an angle that you can get a hold of. If I was to have this just flat like this, it wouldn't it wouldn't have a way to get totally underneath that model. So, the angle you mount your stuff is important. I just mount it on um, a piece of copper, it doesn't really matter what you use really, but I use a epoxy um, or resin to mount the model. If you use hot milk glue, you can release it using um, rubbing alcohol if you use resin, it works the same way. You can just put a couple drops of rubbing alcohol underneath and it just uh, goes and flows underneath the resin and it releases it off the model. So that way you don't hurt the model. Sticky tack's your best friend too. That stuff's amazing. So instead of pins, use this. Um, the only thing difference between the pins and this is I noticed this was peeling the paint a little bit, um, but if you don't use the stepper motor or the pink foam, you might find sticky tack works pretty good too. I think I mentioned uh, when I was doing florals, <laughs> this one's definitely dead, but this is that foam I was talking about, and you notice I mounted like a little sticker on every side, okay? And then I did mount the, f the plant, but then I also mounted this like little like wire that goes up to it. Because when they're alive, not wilty like this, uh, it takes a second to, it takes a second to settle. So this helps the plant settle when it rotates. It rotates once and it wiggles, but with this it doesn't wiggle as much. 
So this foam is pretty cool. See all the different holes I used. Good times. And it mounts really well to your platter with the pins. You just stick them in at an angle, and bam. All right, so you might be tempted to do a Bluetooth 100, no, 500 odd photos over to your uh, laptop computer or wherever you have Lightroom on. But I would say the better way to do that is uh, you know, like download file manager. File manager plus, boom. Get yourself one of these if you have a Samsung. Okay, and then it has an SD card slot in it. Boom. So put an SD card in, boom. Plug this into your phone. By the way, this is the most amazing thing ever made by man. It's the ability to SD cards, HDMI, and network, and if you still have it, a VGA monitor. Uh, super useful, super useful. So take and copy all your files over to an SD card. It takes two seconds, a long story short, and then move them over that way, not Bluetooth. All right, so we're gonna be traveling between uh, different computers on my network um, as I go through this. So primarily I use a junky laptop with Adobe um, Lightroom Classic, not the other one. So I have all my shots and there. I open up Adobe Lightroom Classic. I have all the shots in a folder called Mink Before and I just import them in. Now since I didn't move any lights in the scene, I didn't do anything uh, as far as I just took pictures, I just moved the tripod and I just changed the um, the angle, that was it. So there's not much I have to do to these. So I'll zoom in, I'll kind of look at the detail, I see like a little tiny hair on that, that's good. You can see that the quality of a cell phone picture, right? It's kind of like this... Um, kind of a noisy, you could definitely tell the difference between cell phone and digital SLR. There's no doubt about it. But because of that, it really does a good job of not throwing a bunch of garbage into it. I don't like how maybe the teeth are out of focus here and the back is in focus and then there's a little bit of out of focus right here. So, you know, I'll just kind of look at the overall pics zoomed in. So there's that little tiny hair, which did a good job. You can see that's kind of focused, but you can definitely see the noise, right? That's at, at 50 um, ISO. So the first few things I'm gonna do to any one of these shots, I'm just gonna find a shot that I can kind of like look at is I'm going to sharpen it with Adobe Lightroom. This is in develop mode. Okay, so it's already pretty sharp, but I'm gonna sharpen it anyway. I'm just gonna use a little bit of noise reduction in this. Okay. I'm going to do a lens correction. I'm going to throw off the white balance, see this white, and you can see the white in the histogram up here. So it's good, it's stayed within the boundaries. So there's, this is the, this area right here is the whitest whites and the darkest darks, but you can see the blacks uh, have this little tiny line right there. So that tells me I gotta move my blacks over just a skosh. And you can see how that works. See how like I'm pulling it away from that And what I'm looking at is how things are now appearing in these shadows er shadow areas. Boom. So now I have information right here. And But the whites are out of control now. So I'm going to throw those off as far as the temperature is concerned. Since the skull is brownish, 
you can see if I go this way, it might blend into the background. If I go this way, I'll have a better chance. Look at my histogram, make sure that I'm not into the white regions. If I have any ramps in them over here, kind of look at the overall shot. Notice that I still have a lot of whites here that I kind of want to get rid of. Tone those down. Lower the exposure a little bit to get rid of some of those whites. Better. Lots of information here. Good information there. So I'm, that's what I'm looking for as far as the shot is concerned. All right, so I'll copy that. And I'll do everything here, except for the crop and spot removal. Then I'll hit Command A if I'm on a Mac and Control A if I'm on a PC. And make sure Auto Sync is on. And paste it across the series. Boom. So now what I do is I'll right click export, export, and I'm going to put this on my desktop. It's going to be called, I mean, scroll after. Now I already did this part, so we can go right into the next part. All right, so this is Metashape, um, and Metashape is going to be our primary stitcher together of the, all the photos. And there's a pro version and a non-pro version. This is the non-pro version. The pro version is $3,000, and the non-pro version is like $170. And um, there is such a speed difference between the pro and non-pro. It's sickening. Uh, the software, this company, I would never support because they've they've clearly made it so that uh, those people that buy the three thousand dollar software are going to have an advantage. Yep, I hate those companies. So desktop, here's my folder filled with the exported Lightroom, and I drag it over to cameras. All right, so now that we got it over in the cameras, uh, there's only a couple things to do. Um, first off, we go File, Save As, and we save it into the folder. That way, if it crashes, it instantaneously saves ever all the information. That's nice. Okay, so we don't want to do the workflow part, these align photos, blah, blah, blah. We want to do it as a batch process. So we go batch process, and we go add. And first one is align photos, and you want the accuracy to be the highest. Okay, the rest of the stuff you leave alone. Then we add one, and we add one called build mesh. And we want depth maps for these. Uh, we could do point clouds, but I would I did not see any advantage to them. They take way too long, and they didn't produce any good stuff anyway. So uh, we want depth maps. We want the depth map quality to be ultra high. That's the highest. Uh, the face count to be high. And depending upon how much stuff is in your scene, I'm going to put this at 6 million polys. Okay. So that's going to be incredibly huge, but um, that will encase the little stepper motor thing and everything else and not take away from the skull. That's why I have to do it that way. Hit OK. And you could save this workflow uh, right in the same place. Notice it says save project at each step. And once you hit OK, prepare not to use this computer for a long time. All right, so this is what your project should look like. 
Uh, now what I had done is I changed the camera angle, took a few shots, ran around my lab, did some stuff, and I did that far too many times. I think I did it one, two, three, four, five. So you can see how like these constitutes as different angles. So there's five angles. I've even got one here that I accidentally did twice. <laughs> so that's a lot of images. I didn't really need that. Uh, so there we go. Now, what we're going to do is build a texture. You don't need a texture for it, but sometimes it is useful to get different details in a model. I'll show you how to use that later. So what we're going to do is in Metashape, we're going to be using this freeform selection tool to select everything that is not useful. Now don't get too carried away with this program because it is very hard to navigate in it. So I'm just going to hit delete selection. And then I got some stuff at the top here, delete selection, and that's good enough. Okay. Uh, reason I want to delete that stuff first is if I went to go build the texture, it would build it across the UV range of the whole entire scene. And now it's only going to build the texture correlating to the model. That's why. So up at the top here, I go workflow and I say build texture. Now you don't need a lot of texture. It wants 81 something. So 2048 is what I recommend. All right, so there we go. There's the texture. Now down below, just check to make sure all your cameras got used. They should have this little icon next to them. And then we can export the mesh. File, export, export model. Mink. Oops. And you want the following to be on. All right, so if you ever need to add more photos during the process, you can. You can click here, and then you can just rerun the batch, and it works out quite well. It also tells you here how many cameras were used and how many aligned. All right, now this is already an incredibly long video. Um, I'll do the cleanup process in another video on this model just to give you an example but for right now I would say I just want to kind of like divide these lessons up uh, these kind of beta lessons to show you that's how I import stuff right now and that's how I'm getting it over to a mesh and then later we'll clean the model up and then prep it for 3d print and then print it out so I hope you enjoyed this uh, mini beta lesson of uh, photogeometry. Enjoy.